Let us pray. Praise and honour and glory be to you, O Christ, Son of the living God, God most high, who has created me and formed my soul after your own divine image and likeness, and had made me capable of everlasting happiness. Grant that I may serve you, my Lord, my God and my Father, with a faithful heart, that I may fight against my sins with a holy hatred, and that all sinful passion and affection being destroyed within me, I may be renewed in perfect innocence of life. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who has given me for my use the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all the things that are in them, and has granted them for my service and comfort. Permit, I beseech you, O Lord, that I may never abuse your creatures, but that all the works of your hands may tell of your goodness, and may lead me to admire, to know, and to love you. Praise and honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, out of your affection for me, granted me to be born in the true Christian faith, and has mercifully brought me up from the beginning of my life, supplying me with food and the other necessaries for the nourishment and support of my body. May my heart find no relish except in and through you. May you alone possess my innermost soul. May I exceedingly hunger for you, the bread of heaven, and thirst for you, the fountain of life, so that this life's exile ended, I may deserve to be satisfied with the joys of your eternal perfection. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who up until this time has preserved and delivered me from countless dangers of soul and body, even when I abused your gifts not deserting me. Illuminate my heart, I beseech you, with the brightness of your grace, that truly perceiving your goodness to me and my own ingratitude toward you, I may bemoan myself, I may be hateful in my own sight, but I may please you, my Creator and my only Redeemer, in all things. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when I lie immersed in the most loathsome vices and was leading a most ungodly life, in your long-suffering bore with me for such a long time and brought me to repentance. Grant that my acceptable contrition and holy works I may expiate the stains of my past sin and that from now on I may lead a life of purity and love you above all things with most burning love. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when I was on the brink of the very precipice and just within the jaws of hell, did not permit me to perish, but called me, though deaf, and trying to run from you to the way of salvation. Grant that from now on I may follow after you with humble devotion, and with a joyful heart correspond to your holy inspirations, with from my heart farewell to all things, and may cleave inseparably to you alone. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who always directed me, the vilest of sinners, has protected me, has looked upon me with the eyes of mercy, and still so fondly supports and cherishes me with your goodness, despite my daily transgressions, as if forgetful of all others. You cared for me alone. Grant that I also may love you most ardently, leaving all transitory things for your sake, and may think of you alone, and may with a ready mind and in all places follow and perform your holy will. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall sing your praise.
A reading from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 10. I tell you the solemn truth. The one who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in some other way, is a thief and the robber. The one who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The doorkeeper opens the door for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all his sheep out, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they recognize his voice. They will never follow a stranger, but will run away from him because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. Jesus told them this parable, but they did not understand that he was saying to them what they were saying to them. So Jesus said to them again, I tell you the truth, I am the door for the sheep. All who come before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved, and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy. I have come, so that they may have life and may have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not a shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and abandons the sheep and runs away. So the wolf attacks the sheep and scatters them. But because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep, he runs away. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and they, my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not come from this sheepfold. I must bring them too, and they will listen to my voice, so that there will be one flock and one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it back again. No one takes it away from me, but I lay it down of my own free will. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it back again. This commandment I received from my Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There is no difficulty in the general interpretation of the language of this text. Christ has a personal knowledge of his disciples of the most complete and intimate kind, calling each by name, treating him or her as an individual, according to their nature possessed and the circumstances of their life. What, without exaggeration, may be called a personal friendship is established between the Lord and each of his disciples. By how few is this truth realised and fully accepted as true for himself in his own daily life? You can understand how he might name your name in condescension or in pity or in reproof, but how he should name your name in pure warm-hearted love, in love for you, for your own very self, as cherishing a real, heartfelt, personal attachment to you. That altogether baffles our comprehension, because we feel that there is nothing in us which is deeply suitable to his love. But he loves the goodness that is begun in each one of you. In one word, he loves the ideal you, and resolves by his own grace to make it in due time the real you. The calling and the leading are always united. He calls in order that he may lead. He utters the name that he or she who answers it may at the thrilling word arise and follow him wherever he goes. There are some who wait for the calling, who listen eagerly for the sound of the name, and who would be more than satisfied to hear it spoken in kindness by the shepherd every day, but who are far from having any corresponding readiness to accept the leading of the shepherd. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out, out, of course, from the whole natural sinful life, from darkness and misery into light and joy of acceptance, 
out of infantile feebleness into manly strength, out of narrow views into wider, out of mistake and disappointment into wisdom and better fortune, out of besetting sin into waiting duty, sometimes out of safety into perils which lie on the way to a higher safety, and so on and on in a movement which cannot cease until at length, in his own time and its own way, it will be out of earth and into heaven. The gift of the Spirit of life dwells in those who are united to Christ in a fullness more abundant than was ever revealed before. And the gift of life is not a power or a principle, but a very true person dwelling in us. This is the regeneration for which all ages waited until the Word was made flesh, the new birth of water and of the Spirit, of which the baptism of Christ is the ordained sacrament. Here, then, we see a part of this great promise. In one word, it is the fullness of life given to us by the personal indwelling of the Holy Ghost, which Christ, by his indwelling, has bestowed upon us. Beside this, the gift of life is abundant, not only in its fullness, but in its continuance. We cannot die in our head, because he is life eternal. Nor can we die in ourselves, except we cast out the giver of life, who is in us. Our first head fell, and he drew us with him into the grave. Our second head is in heaven, and our life is hid with him in God. We can die no more by any federal death, but only by our own several and personal death. If sinners die eternally, they die one by one of their own free choice, even as Adam. And we die now no more by single acts of disobedience, but only by a resolved and deliberate course of sin. This reveals to us the wonderful love and miraculous long-suffering of Christ, and of the Spirit who dwells in us. Where once he enters, he up there abides with divine endurance. Let us draw from what we have said one or two practical truths of great importance for us in our daily lives. First, we know that in all our acts there is a presence higher than our own natural and moral power. We are united to Christ by the presence of the Holy Spirit from the moment of our baptism. There has never been a moment from the first dawn of consciousness, from the first twilight of reason and the first motions of the will, when the Spirit of life has not been present with us. The working of the Spirit is, so to speak, coextensive with our whole moral being. He presides over all the springs of thought, word and deed, by his gracious presence, endowing us with power and will to mortify sin and to live in holiness. What then is our life but the presence of the Spirit dwelling in us? Another plain and practical truth is that this presence works in us according to the revealed and fixed laws of our probation. Finally, we may learn that the union of the Divine Presence with us in our probation issues in the last and crowning gift of this life, the gift of perseverance. Faithful is he that calls you, who also will do it. In those countries of the East, where our Lord appeared to the job of a shepherd, is not only a lowly and simple job and a job of trust as it is with us, but moreover it is a job of great hardship and of peril. Our flocks are exposed to no enemies such as our Lord describes. The shepherd here has no need to prove his fidelity to the sheep by encounter with sheep with fierce beasts of prey. A hireling shepherd is not tried. But where our Lord dwelt in the days of his flesh, it was very different. There it was true that the good shepherd gave his life for the sheep. From the time of Adam to that of Christ, a shepherd's work was marked out by a special divine favour, as being a shadow of the good shepherd who was to come. The shepherds of the old were such as Jacob, Moses and David, men at once of peace and of war, men of simplicity indeed, 
Plain men living in tents, the meekest of men, yet not easy, indolent men sitting in green meadows and by cool streams, but men of rough duties who were under the necessity to suffer while they had the opportunity to do exploits. If such were the figures, how much more was the truth itself, the good shepherd when he came, both guileless and heroic. Jacob endured, Moses mediated, and David wrought. Christ too not only suffered with Jacob and was in contemplation with Moses, but fought and conquered with David. Jacob was not as David, nor David as Jacob, and neither of them as Moses, but Christ was all three, as fulfilling all types, the lowly Jacob, the wise Moses, and the heroic David, all in one, priest, prophet, and king. Christ is our shepherd, and his sheep know his voice. Let us be aware of when we are not following when he goes before us. Let us not be content with ourselves. Let us not make our own hearts our home, or this world our home, or our friends our home. Let us keep looking for a better country, that is, a heavenly country. Let us look out for him who alone can guide us to that better country. Let us call heaven our home, and this life a pilgrimage. Let us view ourselves as sheep in the trackless desert, who, unless they follow the shepherd, will be sure to lose themselves, sure to fall in with the wolf.
Let us pray. Stir up, we beseech you, O Lord, the wills of your faithful people, that they, plenteously bringing forth the fruit of good works, may by you be plenteously rewarded. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.